Hey guys, let's talk real quick about that medical secondary assessment. I think this is just a little ambiguous. Um, so I'm going to give you my opinion. You can take that for however you want. Um, but let's talk about it and see if we can make some sense nuts and bolts about this. So the first part of the assessment, whether it's primary or, or uh, medical or trauma, are a lot the same. So um, for like for our students, we learn trauma assessment first. If you're learning medical assessment first, that's fine. It just means that you're going to know the first half of the next assessment you have to learn, which in and of itself is pretty darn cool. Okay, so real quick, we're not going to talk a lot about this um, because I've got another video that talks about the primary assessment, which you might want to check out because it's pretty good. Well, you know, in my opinion, being an opinionated paramedic. Okay, so first of all, PPE. Second of all, that scene size up, those things we're gonna do in route before we get to our patient. Thinking about the scene safety, thinking about is my patient hurt? Is my patient sick? Thinking about how many patients do I have? And that's gonna lead us to, do I need more assistance? And then before we step out of that, ambulance, we want to know if we're going to think about C-spine because that's going to take um, a whole another set of equipment. It's going to take somebody dedicated to manually stabilizing that C-spine. Remember, we are not, not putting a C-collar on right here. Okay. Now, <clears throat> then we're going to go into that primary survey, which in and of itself is the ABCs. Okay, so my general impression is I walk up to the patient, I want to know is my patient alert and what is their chief complaint um, right off the bat. And then I'm going to look at the airway, I'm going to assess that, is it adequate, breathing adequate, and is my circulation adequate. Okay, so um, in that, we're going to, we're going to use our tools, we're going to use our thinking skills, but that isn't really what this video is about. This video is about what happens after the ABCs. Okay. So afterwards, we've got that history taking. Okay. The first part of that is the OPQRST. Okay. Um, and I have another video about that. So if you want to dig into the OPQRST, it's about a 10 minute video. I think it's uh, got some good stuff in it for you. So ask those questions. Now, remember in our medical patient, we're not going down through this checklist and the OPQRST is six questions and that's all I'm asking. It's a lot of questions. I am interviewing this patient, okay? Same thing goes with my sample history. Um, and I have a video about that. <clears throat> Apparently I have a lot of time on my hands um, in this quarantine that we're in. Um, but hopefully I'm making uh, some tools that are useful for you guys. Okay, so we're going to ask that OPQRST questions. We're going to ask those sample questions. So all of those questions are in there for a purpose. Now, if our patient is not having any discomfort or pain, then OPQRST may not be applicable to them. And if it isn't, then don't ask those questions. If your patient tells you one time they're not having pain or discomfort, and you keep saying, well, then describe the pain to me. And they're like, I, I don't have any. And you're like, on a scale of zero to 10, how bad is this pain? About the third question, your patient's gonna be like, are you a complete moron? I don't have any pain. So be smart with that, okay? But what we're gonna talk about tonight is that secondary assessment. So, <clears throat> What do we do with this? This is the part that gets really ambiguous, weird, and they don't just, they don't tell you what you're looking for here. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is questions. A lot more questions. And these are gonna be tailored and customized to your patient's presentation and their chief complaint. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to ask lots of questions, okay? And I'm going to dig into, let's say my patient has chest pain, 
Okay, then I'm going to be looking at that cardiovascular and pulmonary system because that's going to be in the area where my chest pain is. I might look at a few of those, but I'm going to focus right there. <clears throat> so I want to ask questions about, do you have a cough? Is it a productive cough? Okay, how long have you had that cough? Do you feel any tightness in your chest? Um, I want to palpate that chest, which, and I want to look at that chest. So what I want to do with this, I'm going to take that trauma assessment where I look and palpate and listen from head to toe, and I'm going to adjust it a little bit. I still want to do that head to toe, okay? Because if I start at the top of the head and I go down, I'm not going to forget anything. Now, if my patient is telling me that they're having difficulty breathing, more than likely their pelvis is going to be stable, all right? Unless you just pulled them out of a car wreck. But if we're doing the medical assessment, I'm guessing we didn't, okay? So um, be smart with that. Don't get so tunnel vision that you have to check all this every time on a medical patient. Um, if it's not going to apply, if there's no chance their pelvis and hip is broken, then let's let that be. We can ask a question without having to palpate um, all of that. But I do, if they're having chest pain, I do want to start at the top of their head. I want to look <coughs> their head, their eyes, look at the pupils, um, look at the neck. Do I, do I have any swelling in those lymph nodes under the chin? Is my neck, do I have JVD? because JVD is a huge indicator of heart failure. So look at that JVD. If my patient is sitting up and I see JVD, that's notable, okay? I wanna make a note of that. Uh, then I wanna come down to the chest. I do wanna palpate that chest because what I wanna know is, can I reproduce the pain? If I am reproducing the chest pain by pushing on the chest, very likely this is musculoskeletal not cardiac in nature, okay? So I'm trying to rule some things out. Um, I also want to look at the chest. Um, I had a patient one time that had chest pain. Uh, she had shingles on her chest. Now I wouldn't have known that if I didn't look. They were very painful, but what she was telling me is that she had chest pain. Um, and so looking absolutely gave me a good clue. So look at that chest, palpate that chest, and auscultate. Look, listen, and feel. So on here, I want to auscultate the lungs, and I also want to auscultate those heart tones. See if the heart sounds normal. Now, I'm going to have to have listened to a lot of heart tones before I know that. I also want to know, does my heart sound distant or muffled? Because that could indicate that I've got a tamponade or fluid buildup around the heart, okay? So it's lots and lots of questions that are tailored to their complaint. Now, right along with this, if I've got a patient with chest pain and or shortness of breath, could it be neurological? Well, in the case of shingles, yes, it could. That's why I'm looking, okay? I want to see if my patient can move everything. I do want to palpate that abdomen and see how that is. I want to ask them, have they ever had heartburn and does this feel like heartburn? Have you ever had a heart attack and does this feel like that if you have? Um, musculoskeletal, I'm going to touch and palpate that area to see if I've got a musculoskeletal injury. Okay, integumentary is the skin. That again plays into things like shingles um, and those types of things that I might look at. Uh, GIGU. Could this be heartburn? Could it be acid reflux? I, you know what? As a paramedic, I developed GERD, which is a form of acid reflux. My patient hurt, or my chest hurt so bad for a couple of days, I finally went down into our paramedic lab and I did a 12 lead EKG on myself to make sure I wasn't having a heart attack. You know, because God forbid I go to the ER. Um, that heartburn or that acid reflux felt just like my dad described as heart attack feeling. So could that be part of a um, chest pain 
Assessment? Absolutely, yes, it could be. Ask those questions. Do you have heartburn? Do you have it regularly? Do you take anything for it? Have you ever been diagnosed with acid reflux or any such disease? Okay. Um, reproductive tract. Now, this probably isn't going to really apply to that uh, so much, but if I had abdominal pain, my reproductive system would maybe play a big part in this, uh, especially for females. So that's when I would start asking those questions about when was your last menstrual cycle? Have you ever had a hysterectomy? Is there any chance at all you could be pregnant? Um, how is your urinating going? Um, so I'm going to ask that the renal system questions, and I'm going to ask back to the GIGU, um, have you been vomiting? How have you been pooping? And when was the last time you pooped? Was it normal? Okay. Um, lots of those types of questions. And then the psychosocial, you know, can play into my chest pain patient pretty well because an anxiety attack feels an awful lot like a heart attack. They're going to have the same signs and symptoms. They're going to give you the same indications. And for us in the field, uh, it's going to be dang near impossible for us to determine, are they having an anxiety panic attack or is this a cardiac event? We really aren't going to know. So we want to keep that in the back of our mind. Now we're going to treat for worst case scenario. But in the back of my mind, I want to keep in mind, you know, could this be a panic attack? And I may want to ask those questions. Do you have any history of anxiety or panic attacks? Uh, because that's good information to pass on once we hand this patient off. Okay. So do I need to cover all of these systems? The answer to that is quite honestly, no. But once you start digging in and asking questions, I think you're going to find that you're going to cover most of these if you're doing a good secondary ass assessment. Okay. Um, now we might skip one, like reproductive is one that sometimes we don't um, we don't spend a lot of time on if they're if they've got a complaint that has nothing to do with that system. Uh, neurological is some one that sometimes we, we don't have to cover very thoroughly um, unless it's a neurological event, okay? But do know this list, do go through it in your head and think about what questions could I ask that might pertain to this patient's primary or chief complaint um, based off of what I know about these other systems because our body entirely works together and we want to make sure we're checking it all out. And then the very last thing as we go down through, it's not really part of the secondary, but it's those vital signs. If you look in your trauma assessment, vital signs are done first before we take a history, before we do that head to toe, before we palpate, inspect, and all of that. Because in trauma patients, they frequently have internal injuries and we have internal bleeding. The only way we're going to recognize that and be able to, to uh, come up with a severity or how bad is this internal bleeding is by watching those vital signs. We don't necessarily have that issue with our medical patients. Now, vital signs are important, but trending them like we do in trauma where we take multiple sets and compare isn't as important in our, in our medical patients. The history taking that set of questions, that conversation we're going to have with our patient is our biggest and very best tool with medical patients. Vital signs will happen, but there's no urgency to them. Okay. Um, now, if there's two of you on scene and one of you wants to talk to the, comp to the patient, the other one wants to take vitals, that's fine to get it done early. But if you have to prioritize, get your history taking done. That's your best tool go to that secondary assessment, start really tailoring those questions and digging into that chief complaint based on the different body systems that we're looking at. And then we'll look at our blood pressure, okay? So in a nutshell, to develop that field impression, have that conversation, be thorough, be thorough with your questions, be thorough with your communication skills. Put yourself in a position that if you were your patient, you would trust you. Okay? 
Get down at their level, look them in the eye, and listen to them when they give you answers. Okay? Then in all of that, we're looking for those abnormalities. If we take those abnormalities and put them all together, we're going to be able to come up with a field impression that we can develop a treatment plan for. Okay? That's all I got for you guys. I hope it helps a little bit. Have a great week.